thank you all for attending tonight's public lecture. And I'd like to introduce to you our speaker. This is David Malaspina. He is an assistant professor at the Astrophysics and Planetary Science Department here at CU Boulder and a research scientist here at LASP. His research focuses on the study of fundamental plasma physics and space environments. Through spacecraft data, he has explored the solar wind, Earth's ionosphere and magnetosphere, the lunar plasma environment, interplanetary and interstellar dust, as well as the physics of spacecraft charging. To enable these studies, he developed scientific instrumentation for spacecraft, focusing on the measurement of electric and magnetic fields. He has now had the privilege of coordinating the exceptional science and engineering efforts that is produced by the pilot mission concept study, which we're all here to learn much more about. So David, I'll hand it off to you. All right, thank you very much, Willow. And thank you for the invitation to speak today. Thanks for all of you who showed up in spite of the half inch of snow that slowed down apparently everybody else. Um, but there are a fair number of people online. So thank you all for joining as well. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm gonna cover kind of two things. One is uh, what's known as the decadal survey. This kind of sounds like a boring administrative exercise, um, but when you consider what it's laying out, it's actually pretty exciting. Uh, because what we're doing is planning the next 10 years of solar system exploration. So what are the amazing things that NASA is going to go after? What incredible physics are we going to try to learn? Um, and how are we going to do it with these bold, ambitious missions to really explore our own neighborhood? So that's the decadal survey part. Pilot, as I'll get into, is a mission concept that we put together here. So NASA put out a call and said, we want bold, ambitious mission concepts. And we said, oh, we got one. <laughs> And uh, we're fortunately funded uh, to run that study. And um, I'll explain that whole mission concept, why it's interesting, why it's ambitious, and all that to you as we go. So I'd like to start with just this bit. So for folks you know, here and online, just think for a second, how do you describe where you live? How might you describe that to someone? Would you say maybe, oh, I live in Boulder? Well, I don't know if any of us actually live in Boulder, but you know, near Boulder. Um, maybe you'd say you live in Colorado. Maybe you'd say you live in the United States. Maybe you say you're in North America. Maybe you go as far as Earth. Would you go further than Earth? And so what I put to you now is that you really should. Of course, Earth belongs to the solar system, right? It's part of this um, collection of space that's dominated by our star, the sun, of course, um, and then all the energy that that puts out into near-Earth space. And what I would argue is that space is as much of our environment as the environment when we walk out the door or the environment when we go walk in the foothills. All these things in space that, um, all this space weather activity that can happen really affects us on a day-to-day -day level, right? I mean, we think about fire, right? Maybe you think about volcanic fire or the wildfires, unfortunately, that happen around here. But in space, you have stellar fires, right? You have the stars that are burning. On Earth, we can walk outside and feel the wind blow. But if you go out into the solar wind just beyond our atmosphere, you know, not so many kilometers up, the solar wind blows. We have waves breaking on the shore, right? So think about being at the beach. Um, there are magnetic waves that are breaking against the bow shock or against the sort of magnetic obstacle that each planet presents to the solar wind. So all these things we think of as our environment, right? The wind around us, the waves around us, the... Um, all of these things have analogs out in space. This is our environment. And really, you know, we live on an island out in space that is affected by everything that happens around us. And so the, our space environment, this solar system that we're embedded in, um, this is part of our lives every day. We see these things every day, right? You can look outside, even right now, as you're walking in, you can see the moon. The moon is part of our solar system. That's part of our space environment, right? Our atmosphere and the way it interacts with the sun, that's part of our environment. Um, anytime you see, for example, comets in the sky, right? Comets, asteroids, those kind of objects, and the sun itself, the thing that is the source of all the energy that becomes life on Earth, is part of our solar system. That is our environment. Um, and in sort of more specific ways now that the, our civilization has gotten to the point where we're using radio waves a lot more, we're using long conductors like um, um, power grids, uh, to, you know, long uh, current carrying wires to send internet, to send electrical power, 
uh, now that we're in space, we're moving out of our planet, right? Bits at a time, we're moving into low Earth orbit, we're maybe moving into near lunar space. Someday we may even move to other worlds entirely, right? All the way out to Mars, perhaps. And as we get further and further beyond our island in space, the weather and the conditions in that environment start to matter more and more. Um, so trying to understand this and explore this is kind of one of the main goals here. So we explore space to try to understand and predict the behavior of our environment, of the universe around us, of our home. So as part of this, and one way to chart this path forward is that every 10 years, each science division in NASA comes up with a, what's known as a decadal survey. That's a big long word, but it basically means where have we been? Where do we wanna go next? And how do we get there? Those are the three questions a decadal survey is trying to answer. And every division of NASA does this. So there's an astrophysics version of this, a planetary version, earth science, life and physical sciences. But the one I'm gonna focus on is the solar and space physics. This is the one that describes our environment, the things that are immediately around us in space. Um, and in fact, there's even a federal law at this point uh, that's written on the books that basically says, you know, the NASA administrator shall hold these decadal surveys and it shall be run by the National Academies. So I'm not gonna dwell on this too much. Like I said, this is a bit bureaucratic, <laughs> but I do want you to get the big picture. And the big picture is that the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, they select out community representatives. In this case, about 80 people who are sort of taken from all different um, science disciplines and things inside what's known as solar and space physics or heliophysics, uh, exploration inside the solar system in this case. And they build committees out of them. At the same time, they ask the, they ask the broader scientific community to produce white papers. A white paper is basically just a free form description of what you think should happen in the next 10 years in science uh, in this particular field. So that's what happens. The National Academies gets together, picks a bunch of people, says, please write white papers, and the community obliges. In fact, over, well, close to 500 white papers were submitted. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of people putting a lot of time and effort into saying, what should we be doing next? What are the next cool things that we should be exploring in the solar system? So these committees, we build these committees, uh, the National Academies builds these committees. And what they do is they take all that science uh, white papers that are written and they have to read them all. <laughs> That's a daunting task. These papers can be pretty long. I think we were capped at like seven pages, but seven times 500 is a lot of pages. Um, so it's a lot of information to take in. They are also uh, empowered to go ask for input, maybe from um, commercial vendors, maybe from other, other folks in, in the aerospace industry. And what they need to produce are five things. They are told to produce an overview of the research field. What are we doing right now? Why does anyone care? <laughs> Is this compelling work to do? Um, they're supposed to come up with the current state of, of knowledge. What do we know? What have we figured out in the last 10 years and overall? And then they're supposed to come up with, and this is kind of the, the difficult part, is what are the compelling science questions? What are the goals and challenges that are out there for us to understand? And from that, they need to come up with a research strategy. How are we gonna get there? What amazing space missions, what kind of um, advanced computing power do we need to understand the physics of the environment around us in space? And then finally, there's a section on state of the profession where they basically say, how are things going as a profession? Are people more people joining than leaving? Do we have enough opportunities for everyone who wants them? Are we being broadly inclusive to people who are interested in doing this kind of work? So they eventually produce some kind of report at the end of all this. Um, okay, yeah, so on each of these. So where have we been, right? That's the first thing they're tasked with doing. This is the overview and state of knowledge. For heliophysics, this covers the sort of traditional things so structures and properties of the sun, of interplanetary space. So the space between the sun and the earth and the other planets, of course. And then the consequences of solar variability. How does this affect, for example, our atmosphere? How does this affect our spacecraft and communications? Um, and then there's these sort of emerging frontiers that they've been asked to investigate. How can we connect what we can measure in our own solar system with what happens in interstellar space? with what happens on um, 
stars in other stellar systems? What happens at exoplanets, other worlds beyond our own system? How can we use what we measure in our own system to understand those other places in the universe? And then finally, how can we use what we learn in our own solar system to help um, safeguard human and robotic exploration of the solar system? And that comes into a little bit this, this idea of space weather or understanding our local environment. So that's their first task, to figure out where we've been. Their next task, and this is maybe, like I said, the hard one, is figuring out where do we want to go next? Where can measurable progress be made? How do we expand the frontiers of our knowledge? Um, and you know, what kind of approaches do we need to throw at this? So out of those 500 papers that come to them, each describing something that the author believes to be the most exciting thing ever, uh, they need to rank those and prioritize them and say, which one of these things do we absolutely need to do? Which one of them can wait till next time? And then finally, this is the part where I get most excited. <laughs> this is the bit about how do we get there? So say we identify these fantastic science topics, these things we need to know to understand our environment and to live in it successfully. How do we achieve that knowledge? Um, and so they're, they're, they're tasked with coming up with this comprehensive and ranked research strategy. So what are the things we need to go after? What are the ways in which we can go after them? And this first line kills me, I, I love this. They say ambitious, but realistic, right? So shoot for the moon, almost more than literally, but we have to pay for it somehow. <laughs> NASA has a finite budget. So ambitious, but realistic is what they mean there. Um, Part of this is defining space missions. So what can we do that's never been done? Uh, part of this is defining ground-based facilities. What can we learn from things we can build immediately on Earth? What kind of computational infrastructure? Do we need to build massive new supercomputers to learn these things, or can we do it with what we have already? They're also tasked with coming up with how risky these things are and how much they might cost. Uh, and then finally, international collaboration. Are we looking at a project so ambitious that we have to reach out to other corners of the world for them to build pieces of it? Does it require a global effort to achieve or can we do it here um, in the United States alone? And many of these efforts are things that require global cooperation. And then finally, you know, are there any ways we can involve private industry in this um, or anything they can contribute uh, along the way? And then finally, this idea of the state of the profession. So this is basically saying, how is our current workforce or scientific workforce and engineering workforce? What is their expertise and capabilities? How do people get into the workforce? Are there barriers to that? Can we help remove them? Um, and then just kind of look at the, the health of the community. So are there sort of community challenges that exist and, and do we have ways to overcome those? So that's another part of their mandate. Uh, I wanna point out that at CU, we have, Almost 10% of the decadal committee is somebody who works associated with CU. That's huge, right? We have great representation on the committee. Um, and what I have here, I'm not going to read them all, but these are the folks who are on various parts of the decadal committee helping to guide you know, our exploration of the solar system into its next uh, phase. And then this part, you know, of course, they have to rank these and come up with sort of ambitious but realistic missions. Those two things are, you know, kind of pick one maybe. Um, but there are sort of two buckets that these missions can fall into, uh, or major, major uh, divisions. One of these is called the solar terrestrial probes. So these are missions that go after fundamental physics. What don't we know about the way the universe works that we can learn from our own solar system? That's the goal of those missions. And then there's living with the star missions. These are more about predictive capabilities. Are there physics that we have to know to predict our environment and how it might behave in the future. So those two buckets kind of encompass, they're, they're actually literally um, line items of budget. <laughs> and so they encompass the two sort of types of missions that we can send out into the heliosphere for um, large scale missions. So things that cost a fair amount and require focused effort for close to a decade. So, a lot of mission concepts were submitted to the decadal um, and they come in a couple of flavors. One of these is NASA internal concepts. So these are things NASA came up with and wants to um, have the decadal committee evaluate. 
There are community concepts. Those are ones that scientists out there exploring the solar system say, we should do these things. Um, and these need to be done soon. This list of them, and I'll go through these in, in some detail because they're really fun concepts and they're really wild ideas, um, which is excellent. These ones were competed directly. So many people applied for this funding. Six of these were funded to sort of develop them into these kind of more detailed studies. Um, then there's some out there that were submitted as white papers that had no funded study, but are still really good ideas that the decadal needs to consider. And then there's a couple that NASA directs. And NASA says, you know, to the committee, thou shalt explore this mission. Now, one of these is uh, one called Interstellar Probe. And the other are these other ones called the uh, Living with the Star Mission Concepts. I'm not going to cover those. I'm going to stick to the terrestrial probes, things that explore the basic physics. And I'm going to walk through a couple of these because I think these are ambitious and exciting missions. These are things that we can do to explore our solar system in ways that has never been done before. Uh, the first one up here, these are the NASA internal concepts. One is called MAGCON. And this is basically to try to understand energy transfer and the outer edges of Earth's magnetosphere. So the boundary of where the solar wind and Earth's magnetosphere kind of interact. And this mission concept would take a swarm of 30 small satellites and throw them out in a broad, um, well, a swarm, and then have them kind of move through that space, making measurements and trying to get a big picture view of what's going on. Um, the, sorry, the CMO thing, <clears throat> Coronal Microscale Observatory is to take a or build a solar space telescope that can look down to 100 kilometer resolution at the sun. So looking at 100 kilometer structures, those are incredibly small structures to see all the way out from 1AU to the sun. And the goal there is to try to explain this fundamental issue of coronal heating and trying to understand how the sun's atmosphere gets as hot as it does. Um, these now are the mission concepts that were put together by the community and funded to um, elaborate on with mission studies. One of these, HelioDisc, the idea is to send four spacecraft out and a one AU orbit with a spacing such that you can determine the kind of medium scale structure of the solar wind. Through many observations, we've come to think of the solar wind as kind of this network, spaghetti network of uh, tubes of plasma, but is it really? And how, what are the dynamics of that sort of mess of plasma tubes? So that's what that would be targeting. There's a mission called COMPASS, and the goal of this mission would be to send a spacecraft, an incredibly radiation-hardened spacecraft, into the radiation belts of Jupiter, the highest radiation environment that exists in the solar system. Um, the idea here would be to try to understand how does Jupiter accelerate the electrons and ions up to the incredible energies that it does. Um, this one, 4pi, the one on the left here, the idea there is from Earth or from any spacecraft, we get one point of view on the sun, but the sun rotates and the structures on the sun rotate. So we can never capture the full evolution. We can never see the whole picture at once. And so the goal of this mission is to take four spacecraft and spread them out. So we're looking down at the poles, we're looking around the sides, we get the full four pi view of the sun. Uh, this one is particularly ambitious because I kind of like the concept of, um, it's the Magnetosphere Ionosphere Observatory. This is to really understand magnetic field mapping at Earth. Earth's magnetic field is a great big tangle of um, tubes of magnetic flux. And we really have a hard time mapping things from far out in that tangle all the way back to the planet. And so what this would do is fly one spacecraft with an electron accelerator, an enormous electron accelerator that would fire a beam of electrons down that field line and hopefully make a spot, an artificial auroral spot on the ionosphere that we could pick up. So make a part of the atmosphere glow from launching an electron beam from way out in the magnetosphere. That's a kind of a cool mission concept. And then they would have a swarm of small spacecraft that go around and kind of measure the effect. But the goal here is really to untangle the sort of knot of magnetic field that exists about the Earth. Um, another uh, final mission concept that was part of the, the community effort, uh, MACOS, the idea here is to try to understand shocks. So shock physics, of course, really important in aerodynamics, uh, also really important in plasma and fluid dynamics, uh, like the interaction between that flowing, blowing solar wind and the obstacle that each planet presents. And that kinetic physics has never really been explored 
satisfactorily. And so the idea here is to send a mission dedicated to that. Um, it would have one spacecraft upstream of the shock, one spacecraft downstream of the shock, and a couple in the shock itself. So you can see the input, the output, and what happens in between. Um, another mission concept that's out there, this directed mission, is for a thing called interstellar probe. This is kind of the idea is to follow on from Voyager to go beyond Voyager. So not only to make it out to a couple hundred AU, but to make it out to 500 AU and get a look back at our whole solar system and how it's embedded in interstellar space. What is the size and shape and dynamics of the entire solar system as a one object? This one is particularly ambitious because they want to run it over 50 years. That's an incredibly long time to run a spacecraft mission as everyone involved with Voyager has uh, experienced. And so there's, they even have a, um, a sociologist on the team whose job it is to figure out how do you hand off from one generation to the next as this mission goes through multiple generations of scientists. So ambitious, right? We've, we've hit the ambitious mark. Have we hit the feasible? Mm. Um, and then finally, this is the one that's near and dear to me. This is the mission concept that we uh, sort of homegrown that we put together here uh, at, largely at LASP, or at least we were the lead institution. Many institutions were involved. Many scientists, many engineers were involved. Um, this one is called Pilot. And I'll explain in detail this one. Um, but as I explain it, keep it in the context of all those other missions, all those other ambitious ways to explore our solar system. So the place to start is here. Our sun produces a solar wind. A solar wind is a stream of particles that comes off a star. All stars do this, as far as we know. Um, and that stream of particles carries those particles and magnetic field and energy out into space. This video is from a spacecraft called Stereo. And what it's looking at is reflect, or it's looking at scattered light. So light from the sun that then hits electrons in the solar wind and then bounces out to the camera. And what you're seeing as the sort of color gradations are density structures in the solar wind. So you're watching the actual solar wind flow away from the sun in these videos. The sun is way back here on the right. This is a stretched image. So the closer you get to the sun, the more zoomed in it's getting. And you can see this constant stream away but not only can you see that constant stream, but you can see structures in it. Let's see, there should be one that comes off right here. There it goes. That structure is what's known as a coronal mass ejection. It's a piece of the solar atmosphere breaking off and flowing with the solar wind, and then eventually you know, striking our island in space or hitting our planet. So the sun makes this wind. This wind, and these particles that come off the star fill the entire space. They travel from the star, you know, through the solar system, pushing everything all the way to the edge of what defines interstellar space. In fact, part of what defines the boundary to interstellar space is where the solar wind stops and the interstellar medium takes over, the space between stars. So we have a solar wind, we have it everywhere, the other thing we have is we have an atmosphere here on Earth, right? We have oxygen that we can breathe. There's nitrogen running around in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, et cetera. These atoms, these elements are, uh, or can be, uh, when they form molecules, those molecules are broken apart by other photons that come from the sun, particularly UV, but other wavelengths as well. And when those molecules get broken apart, they get charged. You can end up with a positive charge or a negative charge. Uh, but either way, the upper reaches of our atmosphere, because they're exposed to so much sunlight, are charged gas. So what can happen? Thank you, Robin, for this. <laughs> that is an excellent visual. Um, what can happen from there is you have these charged particles high up in the planetary atmosphere. When they interact with that flowing solar wind, what happens is that flowing solar wind, in particular the magnetic field that it carries, can grab these particles and pull them away from the planet such that they do not return. The solar wind strips a planet's atmosphere, removing it over time. So if you live on that planet and you like your atmosphere, as we all do, you do not want it to be removed over time. But it does, right? This is part of living in the environment that we live in. 
So from other missions, um, in particular missions, this is a, a movie that was put together for the MAVEN mission looking at Mars. And MAVEN was exploring how did Mars lose its water? Where did that atmosphere go? Um, and so this is a sort of cartoon slash simulation put together uh, or merged together. And what it's showing you is the solar wind flow coming by the planet. And it's showing you that atmosphere being removed from the planet by that solar wind flow directly. We know this happens at planets like Mars. Planets like Mars, though, don't have a magnetic field. They don't have an internal magnetic field like Earth does. So many times people will show this kind of picture and you'll say, okay, well, there's Mars on the one side with no planetary magnetic field. Therefore, the solar wind can get right to it and pull off the atmosphere. Earth has this magnetic shield that stops everything from removing our atmosphere. Well, not exactly. It's much more complicated than that. In fact, that's a really big science question. That's a piece of our environment that we do not understand. Does a planetary magnetic field really act as a shield against atmospheric loss? Is this protecting our atmosphere or is it making it worse? That's something we would very much like to know. So the answer, of course, is it's way complicated, <laughs> uh, which is why it's still an open question. On the one hand, a magnetic, a magnetic field would seem to protect you because as those particles from the solar wind and its magnetic field come streaming toward the planet, they encounter this obstacle that they have to move around. So it's like a shield that kind of deflects stuff. But on the other hand, it's very large, very much larger than the planet. So the amount of energy that's impinging on your system is huge because now you've inflated your system way beyond the planet, hundreds of times beyond the planet. So now you're taking in much more energy than if you were just the planet. Uh-oh, now we've got a bit of a problem. And from a series of measurements looking at Mars, Venus, and then at Earth, what we can see is that the amount of material lost from the atmosphere really ends up depending on sort of how hard the solar wind pushes against the magnetosphere. If an awful lot more energy is coming in and we have a magnetic field, that magnetic field can actually focus that energy. First, it collects a lot more of it, and then it focuses it into a narrow point on the atmosphere, which can cause additional loss. So maybe this isn't a shield at all. Maybe this is actually making it worse. But the place to answer these questions, the place where we can make the best measurements is at Earth. We have here this nice terrestrial planet with an atmosphere, with a magnetic field that we can explore. So what we're trying to understand, what the pilot mission concept is going after is really mass flow through a planet's magnetic field. How does that gas come out of the atmosphere? Once it's out of the atmosphere, where does it get trapped in the magnetic field? How does it get trapped in the magnetic field? And once it does, how do perturbations or motions of the solar wind, how do they cause that material to then be lost again to the solar wind? And in fact, there's this whole cycle that the, the mass goes through. First, you get some of those ions or charged particles in the upper atmosphere that were created by sunlight. Some of those can escape directly straight out to the solar wind. Um, some of those can even return back to the atmosphere after getting stuck in the magnetic field a little bit. Some of them get stuck in this big torus. We have a big donut of cold plasma that comes out of the ionosphere and gets stuck in our magnetic field. That's called the plasmosphere. But plasma that's stuck in that donut about the Earth can be ejected from the system when the solar wind pushes hard enough on our magnetic field. And so the way I like to think of this is the whole magnetosphere breathes. So you can think of gas as coming up out of the atmosphere and filling up the magnetosphere. And then when the solar wind pushes on it, it exhales out to the solar wind and that material can be lost. And then it refills again from the atmosphere. So the whole system is constantly breathing. But there's limits to how much we know about this. What we know about it so far is based on a couple of um, very limited measurements. And these, limited, these measurements are limited because the thing we're trying to measure, the gas that carries all this mass away from the planet, is almost invisible to spacecraft. It's very hard to measure. 
Um, it's hard to measure mostly because it's cold because it just came out of the ionosphere. It hasn't been heated up to the temperature of everything else that's out in the magnetosphere and solar wind. There are a couple of measurements that we have. We had a, a camera that measures in the UV. It could measure scattered light from helium, um, but helium is only a very small amount of the material coming out, right? There's many other gases that are coming out. We're particularly interested in hydrogen and oxygen, right? Oxygen, well, we breathe that, and hydrogen plus oxygen is water. So those are things we are worried about escaping and would like to know how efficiently they are lost. And if we think about other worlds, exoplanets, planets around other stars, can they maintain an atmosphere and how long can it stay there for? Well, how long does the water stick around? How long does the oxygen stick around? But we can't measure those with current measurements or current technologies. Um, we have one or two point measurements. So think about trying to measure the ocean with a single thermometer. You're gonna get a picture at a very tiny location, but it's not gonna give you the big picture. That's what we've been trying to do. Um, there are models, of course, but they have missing physics. There are pieces of them where the models don't explain the observations. And so we need to fill in those details to really understand uh, how all that mass is moving. And then finally, any spacecraft that you stick out in a plasma charges. It charges up to a couple of volts. And the thing you're trying to measure is less than a couple of volts. So your spacecraft immediately ejects everything you're trying to measure, which makes it hard to measure. There are ways around this, but they require special technologies to be developed. So what is the next big thing we can do? How do we solve this big question? Um, so the official questions that we put in the proposal are listed in white. I'm not gonna read those. I'm gonna read sort of the uh, generic versions of them in, in the colors here. So we really wanna know or how are these ions, these, these partic charged particles created in the upper atmosphere, how are they passed between our atmosphere and the magnetic field? Are they passed back and forth? Does it go one direction? How much flows each way? These are things we would like to know. Once it's out there and stuck in this big donut about Earth, how is it transported? Is it moved toward the planet, away from the planet? How does that flow happen as the magnetic field moves? And then finally, all this cold plasma that's pouring out of our atmosphere and ionosphere, turns out this cold plasma can regulate or govern many of the systems that make up our magnetosphere. So the response of our magnetosphere to the solar wind pushing changes as we add more atmospheric gas to that system. So how does that feedback work? How are those systems affect each other? That's a big thing that we don't know. And here is our ambitious yet realistic plan to solve all this. Um, and this is the pilot mission concept. So this is for plasma imaging, local and tomographic experiments. That's a, a mouthful. So what are we proposing to do? We're proposing to take 30 small spacecraft, about the size of a mini fridge, right? Dorm fridge, that kind of thing. 30 that size, and four slightly larger spacecraft, about the size of a motorcycle or something. And we want to distribute these throughout the Earth's magnetic field close to the planet. Um, in sort of two orbits. So we have one kind of closer, one kind of further out. All these little red dots represent one of those mini fridges. Each one of these um, green dots represent one of these sort of motorcycle sized spacecraft. Now, why do we need 30? Why do we need this big swarm? What are we going to do with it? Each one of these spacecrafts, the concept is that they broadcast radio waves to one another. So each spacecraft in that big constellation broadcasts out to all the others. And all these other ones listen, and then the next one broadcasts, and everybody listens, the next one, and so on. And by doing that, you build up this giant mesh of measurements. And that mesh of measurements, you can take that mesh and use it to reconstruct an image, a picture. And that picture, we can build it every 10 seconds with this constellation. That means we are making a motion picture of the plasma mass moving through the magnetosphere. We're watching it in real time. That's the goal with this. In fact, what we're doing is basically CT scanning the magnetosphere, almost, almost literally, just different wavelengths. The way a CT scanner works, if you all have um, had the unfortunate pleasure of being in one of these devices, which unfortunately I did recently, um, there's an X-ray tube up at the top. It you know, sends X-rays down and you have a whole lot of detectors on the bottom. The patient kind of sits there and then this tube sort of 
moves around and that gives you a full three-dimensional picture of what's happening inside. This is what we want to do. So one of these spacecraft is our broadcaster. There's all our receivers. The magnetosphere is the thing we're trying to measure. We're trying to get a 3D picture of how all this material is moving around um, to understand where our atmosphere is going. And we're going to make, of course, 3D movies of this system. The larger spacecraft, um, what they're designed to do is kind of twofold. One, they're going to make sort of point measurements inside the image. So we'll have this broad view from our image, and we'll have these small spacecraft that are taking points within it so we can compare the big image to the direct, uh, directly measured plasma where we're counting individual particles that we, that we collect. The other thing they're doing is that they're going to have cameras, those UV cameras to watch helium and to watch oxygen. So in the sort of equatorial plane of the planet, we'll be able to measure, we'll get that image from the tomography. And in the meridional or the up and down plane, we'll be able to measure the plasma flows using the UV image. That's how we get a 3D picture. And what we're ultimately trying to do, this on the right here is a physics-based computer simulation of how our magnetosphere sort of responds to the solar wind pushing. Um, on it. And some of the things you see, you see these sort of, um, you know, wave-like structures, and you see them pushing closer and closer to the planet. With the constellation that we've put together, this is a simulation of what that constellation data would look like. You see this structure moving in and bumping up against the sort of cold plasma shell here. That is one of these fingers. We simulated a single finger to show that we could actually measure that with this constellation. And we can measure it over a huge swath of area. So we can measure um, you know, several Earth radii in this direction, several Earth radii in that direction. And so what we would be able to do with this mission is take this physics-based simulation and directly compare it with our real observation. That would be incredible. So then we could say, what physics are we missing in this simulation? Uh, the idea here is that we would do this with sort of two launches, one to put, you know, the inner constellation in, one to put the outer constellation in. Um, this would happen with, well, we baseline something like a Falcon Heavy, uh, which is a pretty big rocket. But there's bigger rockets out there, like the SpaceX Starship. And if that rocket comes along, we can actually deploy all 34 of these in one go, which would be pretty nice. Um, and it would go around the Earth. Remember, the CT scan moves all the way around to get a 3D picture of the whole system. These spacecraft, this whole constellation, would move about the Earth roughly every two years, giving us a full picture of the whole system. We could watch all of that mass move. <clears throat> and why now? Why should we bother doing this now? Why is this the right time to do it? One really important scientific motivation is that all these little pieces of the magnetosphere have been explored one at a time. This is the old elephant problem, right? We had one spacecraft exploring the trunk. We had one spacecraft exploring the foot. We had one spacecraft exploring the ear. What the heck is this thing? We've never really looked at the full picture. We've kind of put it together from the pieces that we have, but this mission would really look at how all these systems connect to each other. How do they influence each other? What is the big picture of how our magnetosphere behaves? The other reason to do this now, and many of you may have even seen this in the night sky. Um, I saw this at dusk one night. I was out with my family for a walk. We saw this kind of constellation of funny things floating across the sky, and we're like, what in the heck? Um, turns out this is part of the Starlink constellation. So SpaceX, commercial company, is launching you know, up to 50 or more of these things at a time, spacecraft that are sort of 200 kilo spacecraft, very heavy objects, but they're launching 50 of them at a go. And right now, above us at this moment, there's at least 3,500 of these spacecraft. 3,500 of one type of spacecraft. In fact, what they're aiming for are 42,000 of these things to be orbiting above our heads all the time to deliver internet. But what this means is that the commercial world has already figured out how to launch giant constellations of spacecraft. What we need for our science is 30. 30 for these guys is a rounding error. Seriously. They lost, you know, 50 of these. A whole launch of them actually went down not so long ago, less than a year ago. And they said, oh, okay, we'll launch more. 
So the commercial world has figured out how to do this. Constellations are no longer scary. These are things that NASA can take advantage of to do incredible science. And so this is a reason why we would want to do this now is because now this technology exists. And then finally, another reason why now, uh, many of you are probably aware of one of the things that happened you know, in, in sort of space exploration not so long ago is the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb has now enabled the capability to explore other planets' atmospheres, planets around other stars. We can start to probe those atmospheres and figure out what gases are there. Where are they in planetary formation? So are those gases there at the very beginning of a solar system? Are they there at the very, old, you know, at the very end or the very old solar systems? How do they evolve along the way? We can measure them by looking at different stages in that evolution or life cycle of a planet. But what they really can't answer right now with that kind of data is how does a planetary magnetic field fold in there, right? There's a couple of things. You have the stellar wind that's trying to blow away the atmosphere. You have the atmosphere itself created by the planet's um, sort of chemistry and makeup. And then you have the planetary gravity that's trying to hang on to the atmosphere. The piece they're missing is what the magnetic field is doing. So all these explorations of other worlds, all these explorations of how their atmospheres are evolving or you know, can they be, can they support life? How long can they support life in the life of a solar system? We can help answer those questions by measuring near Earth in our natural environment plasma laboratory that's right here for us. So finally, the goal of this mission is really to follow the mass, right? To see where the mass goes through our nearby space and to watch our magnetosphere breathe to pull in gas from the atmosphere, capture it in the field, and then eject it out into the solar wind. We want to discover the physics of atmospheric loss at Earth-like planets. That's something we can apply to other stellar systems to understand the probability of life forming other places. We want to close these long-standing knowledge gaps. We want to measure this nearly invisible cold plasma that we really have few ways to track. And we really want to understand how our magnetosphere acts as a connected, system. We know all the pieces, we don't know the whole. And what do we do to get there? We need this sort of 34 spacecraft. Again, a small order compared to what the commercial world is doing. Uh, we want to measure, the, use the tomographic imaging, so CRCT scan. We want to use um, UV cameras to watch the oxygen and helium flow out. And we want to make measurements within those images so that we can anchor them in direct ground truth particle counting. Okay, how much does this cost, right? Where's the feasibility part? The cost of this mission is actually not so different from missions that have been launched in the last 10 years that were you know, recommended by the last decadal uh, or two decadals ago maybe, including Parker Solar Probe, a mission that's exploring the near sun environment or the Magnetospheric Multiscale Mission or MMS, which is exploring a process called magnetic reconnection in near earth space. The cost of those missions scaled to the dollars it would take to launch this mission are not so different. So we're not talking, um, we're talking ambitious science, but we're not talking budget busting um, prices. So finally, you know, our mission concept, this pilot idea, that's one of them, right? I sort of laid out a fair number of the other mission concepts that have been explained or that have been proposed. And really, however these things get ranked, whatever the decadal survey comes up with, um, the next NASA missions that are sent out into our solar system will make amazing discoveries. Any of these missions will. Um, and what they're really going to discover is about the place we live, about our home in space, right? Our direct environment. So however the decadal sur tur survey turns out and however these missions end up getting ranked, um, we're gonna learn incredible stuff. So that brings me to the end of what I have. Uh, I think I'll just open it for questions and discussion at that point. But thank you everybody, very much appreciated to the folks who turned out here in person especially, but also the folks online for taking the time. Uh, thank you. Hey, oh, there it goes. Um, we'll open up the floor to questions. We'll do one in the room and then one online and we'll keep doing back and forth. So any questions? All right, well, I, oh, Robin's got one. Hi, Dave, nice talk. Thank you. Um, I was thinking about what you said about constellations. Um, 
uh, we have these massive constellations, but they tend to be in low Earth orbit. Uh, do you see any particular challenges with creating big constellations at much higher altitudes? Not particularly. I mean, we know how to design spacecraft to survive those altitudes. It's simply making many copies um, and putting them out there. I mean, the only thing is sort of delivering them there, you know, but that's something we've worked through in terms of figuring out how large of a rocket and when it needs to launch and all that sort of thing. Um, so delivering spacecraft to those locations and building spacecraft to survive there, that's been done for decades. The only thing we're suggesting to do here is simply make more copies. Uh, something that has already been, like I said, the commercial world is well underway. I would also say that uh, we built in some um, architectural redundancy into the system. So we have uh, 30 of these small spacecraft. We can make the measurement with 26, right? Um, so we, we planned for you know, in case a few of them crap out, we're going to be okay. So. Oh, God. sorry, I'm Connie Spittler. <laughs> so, right, Connie helped out with the study, did a huge amount of work um, putting together this mission concept study. Okay, so um, I'm Amy Merkel, and I'm part of the Office of Communications, and I'm going to uh, ask a question from online. Um, so, uh, this is from, uh, observational astrophysicist, uh, uh, they're referring to themselves as a baby. So a young, maybe undergraduate, um, I'm curious about how these large constellations will affect ground-based astronomy. So the Starlink constellation with 42,000 spacecraft is going to do more than anything NASA will ever put up, right? That, that's going to, of course, be trouble for ground-based astronomy. The mission we're describing comes close to Earth, but only for a small portion of its orbit at a well-known time and a well-known place. Um, and so it won't have anywhere near the impact that the Starlink constellation already has. Uh, yeah. Are there any technologies that we've developed at last that will be leveraged with this mission? That we've developed at last. So, I mean, technically, yes. So part of one of the things we do want to do is make uh, density measurements at each spacecraft and they need to be pretty accurate to reconstruct that image. And so one of the things we would use is the plasma sounder that we've been developing here to try to make those in situ measurements and get the density at each point along the spacecraft orbit. <clears throat> so that's a particular LASP technology. As far as general technologies, the idea of sending radio waves and measuring their propagation or changes in their characteristics through a plasma, I mean, GPS does this all the time. Uh, in fact, people use this to get whole pictures of the Earth's um, ionosphere or that ionized gas using GPS. That's a commonly done technique. It's been done for 20, 30 years. What we're trying to do is take it out into near Earth space instead of sort of ground to space. All right, Amy again. Um, so there's a couple of questions online that kind of pertain to the same thing um, about choosing of the proposed missions. Is there only one that's gonna be chosen or, and then when will the rankings be announced in the decadal or? Right, so all the decadal committees can do is prioritize. They can say, this is the most important thing that needs to be done. Here's the next, here's the next. And they deliver basically a list. And that list includes the cost and feasibility. And then it's up to NASA to figure out how to do it, to take the budget they're allocated by Congress and see how many missions they can jam in there in what order. Uh, that's kind of NASA's problem. The decadal simply says, this is most important, this is next most important. Okay, um, so really quick, last part of that question was when would those decadal results be out? Oh, sorry, uh, I have yeah. Question. So sometime in 2024, the date is not specified. Nobody's really said like, it'll be, you know, April the 1st or anything like that. Um, it'll, it'll when they're done with it, but I think they have to produce it by 2024. Uh, so they'll come out with this big document that's available to the public. So anybody can check it out uh, to see what kind of ideas were out there. Um, but yeah, 2024. 
And then what is um, the like uh, mission lifetime plan? And is there an end of mission plan for the buses? Yeah, so the way we designed this one was for at least a three year mission that allows us to get around the whole magnetosphere at least one and a half times so we can see the full environment. Um, so that was sort of the baseline plan, but it's a constellation and it's right around Earth. So if individual spacecraft kind of stop working, you can refresh them. Right? You can have another launch that puts up another copy and you can fill it right back in if, if so needed or if you have um, the resources to do so. So constellations are nice because you can kind of replace them as parts break uh, in a way that you can't with individual spacecraft. Um, and then where are we, how do we get rid of them? Uh, of course, orbital debris is a big problem and we don't want to add to that. Um, 42,000 spacecraft in low earth orbit is an orbital debris problem immediately, even if they don't break apart. Um, so the spacecraft orbits that were designed were very, were designed with that in mind. How do we get rid of these things in a safe and responsible way? So the spacecraft in the outer orbit can be deorbited into the atmosphere and burned up when need be. Um, the spacecraft in the lower orbit can be moved to a known parking orbit where we basically put uh, space trash <laughs> at some point or spacecraft that are no longer uh, active. But it's a designated place where everybody knows to keep away from it and it's a controlled orbit. Does that mean that these have propulsion? They have enough propulsion to get them where they need to be and to arrange them if one breaks. So we have this string of one of spacecraft that come out to create this mesh. And if one of them breaks, we can rearrange the others to fill in that mesh and get our picture back. So they have enough propulsion to be able to do such things and to dispose of them at end of mission. Yeah. That was my own personal question. So <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I cheated. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so uh, a follow on to our discussion right now about missions being proposed. So if your mission, say, isn't ranked and not appear in the decadal, what would you do next? Like, would you still propose it or? Well, so we wouldn't be able to propose it directly because these scale missions are flagship missions. These are sort of greater than a billion dollars. These are not things that um, any other funding mechanism exists for except this kind of major decadal process. Um, so if it's ranked lowly or low on the list, what we can do is first of all, you know, try it next time around 10 years from now. Uh, that's not very satisfying. But what we can also do is try to reproduce parts of it uh, with smaller spacecraft. So can we do, for example, just the tomographic mesh, maybe with very small spacecraft for a much lower budget? That's a thing we could attempt. Um, so there's other ways to get pieces of the science, but to get all of that science and answer that big picture, we need kind of this large scale uh, solution. So if you're... Um if pilot were to be chosen for the decadal and become a successful mission, would you like to make it smaller scale to be a part of something like James Webb? Because you were saying earlier that um, the magnetosphere was one of the only things not measurable by James Webb. So James Webb measures the atmospheres of planets in other stellar systems far, far, far beyond our own. Um, so the way we could combine those two together is we could get knowledge about the basic physics of how a magnetic field either you know, helps you re retain or lose an atmosphere. And we could take that basic physics and apply it to you know, observations at other worlds, but we wouldn't be able to sort of, the missions wouldn't work together directly. Um, it'd be more like you get a piece of the physics here and a piece of the physics here, and then you kind of model them together. Okay, do you um, anticipating uh soliciting these builds of the 30 copies um, to commercial aerospace companies or would you want last to build it or? Well, so we don't have control over that. We can propose something, which is what we did in the, in the uh, mission concept is we basically said, you know, it'd be nice if there were commercial vendors out there that did this because they know how to make 30 copies of something. Um, but ultimately any of these mission concepts when they get delivered from the decadal, you know, ranked over to NASA, NASA has to figure out how to make them happen. So we don't get to control that from this stage. We can only suggest things, and then NASA ultimately has to make it work however they can. 
but it would make sense to have a commercial vendor do it since they're really used to producing that many copies, having assembly lines and, and being able to check the quality of so many items um, carefully. Hi, um, I don't remember if you said this, but is, is this just one string um, of the satellites, like 30 satellites in one sort of orbit, or are you offsetting them? They are arranged such that uh, 14 of them go in this inner orbit and 16 of them go on the outer orbit. So if you're thinking of them as like beads on a string, there's sort of two strings of, of spacecraft. Okay, and then are they offset in inclination to get that full picture or no? No, actually we don't want them offset in inclination. We want them in the same plane because we're trying to make that image, right? So okay. we're trying to send enough uh, lines of sight through the same plasma that we can reproduce that image. So you really want that inner and outer are kind of gonna define the edges of that mesh. Um, okay. And so you want them to move together in a plane. Okay, so when you're having one view, right, complete view, is this just in one plane um, then? It is. So this image created by the tomography would be in one plane. And then we get the other plane from the cameras. So the cameras are in that plane looking back at Earth. And so they can see sort of the up and down, whereas the measurement, you know, left and right would be done by the, the tomographic imaging. So we combine those two image planes to get a full picture of the system. Okay, I see. Thank you. So following along with that, is there um, any potential synergies with other mission concepts that would help your science goals with pilots? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, an enormous number uh, in terms of like ground measurements, for example. So trying to understand the energy that's entering into the atmosphere that then eventually causes um, you know, the atmosphere, uh, the, those particles to be lost. Uh, looking at the amount of solar energy that's added to the system is really important to know because that's the main driver of creating, turning the neutral gas into those ionized particles that eventually escape. Um, I hesitate to align this with the other instrument concepts in the sense that they're each huge, right? And probably what will happen is over the next decade, NASA will have enough budget to do one, maybe two of these. So it doesn't make so much sense to, to line them up because they simply won't be able to field them all at the same time. Uh, but there are many smaller missions and Earth-based missions that you could imagine that would help the science tremendously. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so um, there's a question about data loss over the lifespan of the mission. Any concerns there, overcrowding of constellations um, with other space debris? Well, so for space debris, we did talk about that, right? We are going to dispose of these things responsibly, or that's part of the plan. Um, in terms of, you know, data loss, believe it or not, the, the proposal that we put together contracts with Amazon to bring the data down. Isn't that amazing? The same company you can buy, you know, a giant pallet of toilet paper from, you can also take down spacecraft data from. That's a, a, a service that they sell. But that also speaks to this being the right time to do this, right? This is at a time when a commercial ecosystem exists where you can buy bits and pieces of a mission to help out uh, build it. You don't have to build everything from scratch anymore. And so part of the ground system that we would use is this distributed network of ground to space communication that Amazon has set up. Um, and that helps us alleviate issues with data dropping or data crowding or constellation crowding of ground stations because we would have this distributed commercial system that we could access. So I think we're coming up on time, right? I guess following along with that, what is the data volume of something like this? Uh, so what I would say is that these reports are gonna be public. In fact, the report associated with every one of these super ambitious mission concepts will be public. Uh, the National Academies will release them to the world and any of you can check them out and see all these fine details are in there. But I can get it to you afterward, I just have to look it up. <laughs> Anything else online? Okay, well, let's give Dave another, David another round of applause. Hello, thank you.
Um, and thank you all again for joining us tonight. Our next public lecture will be on April 5th, and it'll actually kick off um, last 75th anniversary. So that starts this April, and the lecture will um, kind of go over the history of LAF, um, where we are and where we're going.